Many Christians could probably share the basics of what they believe. But what if you were to ask them why? Why do they believe what they believe? How can they believe in a God when there's pain in the world? Why do they read a book written thousands of years ago? The discipline of apologetics helps answer these questions and many more. While theology is what Christians believe, apologetics seeks to provide a reason why they believe it. This will be the topic of discussion today on the Falling Forward podcast. Join myself and our host Dakota Adair as we discuss the importance of knowing why you believe what you believe. We are joined in this discussion by our friend Travis McNeely. Travis is a fellow student of Southwestern while also serving as the student pastor of Woodlawn Baptist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We hope you enjoy this insightful discussion and be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. I'm Clayton Carver and you're listening to the Falling Forward Podcast. The Falling Forward Podcast exists to encourage Christians to continue to gain ground in their faith. Please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. And thank you for joining us as we have insightful conversations about never falling back, but falling forward in the Christian faith. All right, guys. What's going on? What's up? Hi, bud. How y'all doing? Doing good. You doing good? Man, it is. I'm like, I'm thrilled that Travis Manili is in the house. Yeah, it's fun to be here. So, guys, listeners, if you don't know, so the first podcast ever recorded was me and Travis sitting in this room in a hotel on the seminary campus. We had we had one microphone, and we just like handed it to to each other. And I did not know what to say. I was trying my best to like ask questions, and I'm still doing that now. But um, it was pretty pathetic. And but funny. man, you were the friend. Like you were supportive. <laughs> you gave some like awesome answers, and I accidentally deleted like half the interview. <laughs> That's why it hasn't been posted. Humble, <laughs> yeah, humble beginning. So um, you are a special guest, man. Well, thanks. So how's it been, man? Because the last time I, was, I spoke to you, um, we had um, you. You were just about to leave the Woodlawn Baptist Church in mm-hmm. uh, Baton Rouge, yep. Louisiana. And you were talking about all that you hoped that you would do, and and the life that was ahead of you, and like a, a huge chapter that you were, mm-hmm. you're the page you were about to turn. Yeah. And so, um, man, talk a little bit about how's how's everything been going? Yeah, I mean, after being in Fort Worth for eight years, it was um it was hard to leave, but at the same time, incredibly exciting. I remember just getting on the highway and um, kind of my last side of Dallas, and just kind of tears running down my face, like God, you've done so much in my life here, you know, and. You've equipped me for something. It's like you said, a new chapter, and uh, coming into it, and there's a lot of unknowns, and there's a lot of um, things at Woodlawn that you know that God was already laying on my heart through having met the people through the interview process. Yeah, you know, and just was praying uh, for the students and the staff and the church, and just just so excited, you know. And um, I, you know, I, I feel like I wouldn't even need coffee for the drive there. I was just so thrilled, you know, so ready. And um, so we get there, and w- the funny thing is when we pull up. There's like, I don't know, 30, 40 people there to unload our U-Haul. And like, it took us like, you were there. It took us like five or six hours to load up our U-Haul. Yeah. And they did it in like less than 45 minutes, unloaded the whole thing. And it was just, wow. it was just incredible. So just the hospitality when we get there and just the love that was shown to us by the church. It was just, it was so sincere and so real. And it kind of seemed like, uh, not that it was fake, but like you hear all the bad stories of churches and seminary and you think this is too good to be true, Right. And it's been neat to see just the love that people have for each other at this church. And it's been really encouraging to me and really seeing the body of Christ come together. No one there is perfect. I've seen sin since I've been there, right? But it's just still uh, the way the body of Christ loves each other. It's just one of the most encouraging things I've seen at, at that church. Wow, that's that's awesome. So what's funny is, is that listeners you won't be able to see, but we have a bunch of um, high school guys here with us. And Live co- audience. And, what's and up? In college. College, right? Wow. So they're here with us. Um, which is pretty cool, man. You came with the crew. Yeah. Um, me and Clayton, man, we've um, we have been looking forward to this time to sit down with you. Like we've been looking for, like this is this interview has been on our schedule just because um, he's been very excited the last week because awesome. he gets he gets to see you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a little bit of a bromance here, <laughs> um, but you know I think I think it's that because um, it's it's fun to just to kind of you know like. That's the beauty of, you know, we're, we're going to, like, God's going to use us in, in, in many different ways, yeah. but different many places. Like, he's going to send us out. But the fact is, is that here is where 
this is the preparation. This was a time that we were mm. we were growing, learning. Um, it was time to love people and learn all the the, the foundation before we start a ministry. And so I'm doing that now. I'm a shepherd. Yeah. I always joke around. I'm a shepherd's boy, <laughs> and so I'm in the field. I'm learning. And so um, mm. it's just it was it's a sweet moment, man. Because I remember some of the conversations we've had, and even conversations you've had about the season of life that you were in. Mm. But this is, I mean, this podcast has been a huge blessing, man. What do you, what, Clayton? I mean. Oh, absolutely. Um, the support has been great. The encouragement from friends and family um, has been um, more than I expected. Hmm. Um, and I know that, I know, Travis, you were a big encouragement to Dakota um, hmm. when he was really working through getting this started. Yeah. Um, so you you deserve a good amount of credit for all this. Well, um, I really believe in Dakota. I think he, you know, he, like you said earlier, you're someone who's just wanting to ask why and seek those things out. And I think by having conversations with people of faith and not of faith and just starting those things, you get to answer those questions and seek yeah. those things out. And I think a lot of people are wanting to ask why, and they don't know how. And so this mm. might be a good avenue to, to do that for that's, people that's, of different walks of life. That's exactly what it is. You know, I think um, well, it's funny because I'll come here, I'll have these great conversations with these guys, and I'll go back home or I'll talk to someone. I'm like, man, I just had this good conversation. And and, and he said this, and I said, I, I, I can't remember all that we said, but it was <laughs> awesome, and I wish yeah. you were there. And that happens all the time. And so I was like, you know, podcasting, hey, here we are. Um, Clayton, man, like he's a guy that's that I met at Sue is like we have just wrestled. We always wrestle with God and truth and, and, and every day we do it. And it's I feel bad because I feel like we're both like in the we think the same as far as we're just very not, not critical, but um, we're always kind of analyzing everything. And mm -hmm. it's always on our mind because we're always wrestling with it. Yeah. And we challenge each other. And so, so um, this has been a great avenue for that. Um, anyways, so man, it's, um, it's fun to have you here. So, so tonight has been a special event. So the listeners that don't know at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, we've had the Stand Firm Conference. Mm -hmm. So Travis, man, you love this event. So tell the listeners a little bit about what this is. Yeah. So Stand Firm Apologetics Conference has been going on for a number of years. Uh, last year they, we had John Mark Reynolds and Michael Shermer do a debate and Tim McGrew was here. Excellent Before, debate. Yeah. I was, was there. Really yeah. good debate. You can watch it on YouTube. And then also uh, before that, we've had other speakers like uh, J.P. Moreland's come and, and others. And it's just been really a neat thing to watch grow and continue to grow every year. And this year's uh, Nancy Piercy uh, is back and or here for the first time. And she wrote on her book, Love Thy Body, which is about answering the hard questions about life and sexuality and pretty much the watershed issues in our culture today. And so her first uh, lecture tonight was really good. And she had shared it at the Heritage Foundation before. And, uh, which is a secular organization, and she gave it to us from a, uh, pretending we were a secular audi audience, in other words. So she would speak, she's speaking to us how she spoke to secular people. And so it was neat to see how she unfolded her arguments and unfolded her ideas and how it really just made sense with reality, really. Because mm. I know um, you had actually mentioned, because you had introduced me to her. Mm hmm and you were you were actually one of the first people to actually read her book, Love That Body, right? Yeah, I got to do, uh, it was really neat. I just saw an advertisement to uh, get an early copy and do a review for it and through the publisher. And so I inquired about it, and they let me do it. And so I got an early copy and got to write a review and read it. And it was so encouraging to read and yeah, be I remember, part of that. I remember you sent me something about um, abortion that she had wrote, and it was like, wow, hmm. some strong stuff. It's amazing yeah. what how words can just cut. Mm-hmm. And she has a really good way of writing towards at a popular level too. She's very brilliant. But like even even like my parents, like my dad's reading it. He doesn't have a college education. He's a very smart guy. You could talk to him about theology all day, but you know he he hasn't been trained in a lot of technical terms like we maybe we at seminary have, right? Mm -hmm. And but he can pick up this book and it's deep, but it's not too deep where he can't understand it. Yeah. Right. And so that's really neat to see. You know, people of all walks of life could really pick up a book like this. And I think she even said it might be at a high school reading level um, type of book. So. Yeah, I know um, Ravi Zacharias was, um, you know, he's one of my favorites, and he was. They always say is he thinks like a thinks like an Easterner, and talks like a Westerner. <laughs> he has the ability to just everyone is clinging to his every word. Yeah, and you have to do that. You know, mm -hmm. there's 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 millions of smart individuals, but the personality, but also the love. Mm -hmm. And so I listen to some of Nancy's stuff, and she just seems like she really loves the people she's talking to. Yeah, and and even loves the people she's talking about. Talking you know, about, she's not yeah. even just like trying to critique them and say, ha, we're right. You know, like she has genuine compassion and, and even you can see it in her writings it's bleeding through just that these people of, of, that believe the secular ethic for the body really hate the body. And it's actually really sad because they're destroying themselves. 
You know, mm. I mean, transgenderism, right? The people are that get the surgery to that are, is irreversible. They're absolutely depressed and sad uh, as a result. A lot of suicide rates happen as a result, and um, it's um, it's quite tragic, you know, because it's not the way God designed things. It's not the way God intended things. And so, um, one of the quotes I loved from uh, the session tonight, she talks about a girl. Uh, I think her name was Noor, and she said, "It's not deconversion therapy." to love your body. And just let that sink in. A lot of people get mad about deconversion therapy. But she's like, look, I, I, she was once a transgender girl, I think, in the, or I don't know which way it was, sorry. But she was, you know, she was, her biological gender, she denied for a while and then went back to it. And she said, for me to love my body the way I was made, that's not deconversion therapy to, to leave this transgender lifestyle. And she's like, I just learned to love how I was made. Now, I don't think she was a Christian, but it, she made a really strong point. There's something about our biological design and our makeup that says something about what God has done and created for us. And um, it was a really beautiful testimony. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, you bring up, so you bring up an interesting point about how her book and her talk tonight, even, you said this earlier, is a, at a real, it's very intellectual and it's very deep, but it's at a very... It's in a language that that people who don't have formal training can still grasp the gravity of what she's talking about. Um, And that's something that's been on my heart um, since I've studied apologetics, Mm. um, is this idea of bridging the gap between academia and the everyday person. Yeah. Um, Because there's just this, there's this, there's the group of people in society that want to learn and they end up in the academy, but then they're kind of isolated from the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, and there's this and gap. towers. Yeah. There's this gap that's been created so that um, for, in Christianity, so people in the pews um, don't have this kind of training and they, they're struggling to address these issues. They see them just like we do, mm-hmm. but they don't have the tools and they're not equipped like we are. So talk about kind of the value that you've learned, um, First off, how you got interested in apologetics. I'd be interested to hear that story. Okay. And then kind of from your training, how you saw how you can kind of bridge that gap from a master's level the- theology and philosophy degree to bringing that down to the level where these guys sitting with us can understand it. Yeah. Because mm. we want to know, like you said, like why, why, you know, talk about your story a little bit, but why Nancy's so important? Why, why she's so important for, and pivotal yeah. for our Why generation. someone like this and a communicator yeah. Why are like we even talking about her? For yeah. the average Joe that's listening right now, why yeah. does, she, does she even matter? And so yeah. break down a little bit what he was asking about that. Yeah, so I'll start with, I guess, my story and how I got introduced to apologetics, and I'll go to that. So I, um, I kind of got introduced to apologetics in a really hard way. Uh, my youth pastor's father, my youth pastor being Barry, Barry Russell when I was a kid, he's pastor of the Grove Church in Florida now, um, his father was killed by a drunk driver. And when that happened, uh, I was woken up to that news. And I immediately started bawling. And we were going up to Gainesville, Florida, from where I was growing up in Titusville, to go see if his wife was going to make it from that car accident. And she was on um, life support, or IC- ICU. She was going to pass, possibly, but she, she lived. And um, But on the way up, I remember laying down in the back seat of my dad's truck. And I remember just thinking to myself, God, why would you allow this good man this guy to get killed by some stupid idiot who's just drinking in in the middle of the day. And he, he gets, you know, hit and he dies. Now, they were on the phone with Barry, who was my youth pastor at the time. And, and you know, hearing the story is one of the hardest things I'd heard um, where he heard them die. He heard, he heard the car accident happen. He heard a gasp and that happened. Um, and I just, you know, loving my youth pastor and being a 12, 13-year-old kid, uh, and, and going to the funeral and seeing just the sadness, uh, I got really angry at God. I um, I concealed it, though. I was at church every Sunday. I was at church every Wednesday. I was involved. And for being someone who's an extrovert, I could not talk about how I felt about God. And uh, I was just so distant from him. And so uh, I ended up going to summer camp at uh, Word of Life Bible Institute, uh, Word of Life Summer Camp in Florida. And it just had a huge impact on me, those counselors there, and they shared the Word of God. And I... I just being exposed to the Word of God again gave me a love for God again and a trust that was being rebuilt. And to make a long story short, you know, I ended up going to Word of Life, and as I was at Word of Life, I was challenged by my one of my best friends, Jake Smith. He's a missionary in Taiwan about just exploring the life of the mind. And I was always so hard on myself, and but he encouraged me just to uh, to read and to study and to know God's Word and to show myself approved as a worker who needs not be ashamed, right, but to rightly divide the Word of truth. And so, you know, these these why questions when I was so frustrated that people would not, 
when I would say, why is this happening? They would just tell me what to believe, but they wouldn't tell me why. And that motivated me to know God's word and to, the, to know why. And so I ended up at Southwestern and at the college here at Southwestern, which is Scarborough College now. And um, so through that process, how God has shaped me as a person is I understand that there's hurting people out there. And these hurting people have walked away from their faith. I know many of my friends who even went to Bible college who walked away from their faith. And it was one of the hardest things for me to see that. And a lot of it's because they had questions. And people just wouldn't answer why. They wouldn't dig down deep. And sometimes these students didn't know where to look. They'd go to their pastor. And their pastor, their pastor, a trained seminarian, could not give them an answer. Now, I don't think there's answers to all things in the sense of, like, we can get a perfect answer because we're imperfect people. But God is perfectly communicated to us through his word, so his word has all the answers we need. But still, it's a very, uh, there's a lot of complicated things that we wrestle with in life, and dealing with the problem of evil is one of them for many. And so I wanted to explore this further, and I, and I have, and it's, it's definitely one of the hardest. When I first went to Woodlawn, my very first Wednesday night, I had the youth fill out a survey, and I said, you know, what, what are the kind of things you wrestle with? Some tough questions, and the, I had two of them. My main two ones, the problem of evil, and same-sex marriage. Yep. You know, this is what these kids want to know about. Why is there evil and suffering in the world, right? And then, but then also same-sex marriage, cultural issues, right? So these are big things at the front of kids' minds. And so uh, as a pastor, Ephesians 4.12 says, I am called to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building of the body of Christ. So that means the saints, the church, has a ministry. The members, they have a ministry to build up the body. My role is to equip them for that ministry. And so when it comes to how Nancy is an intellectual, um, is writing these books and getting to the common person. I think Frances Schaefer did that a lot as well, who's a, a, a guy she was mentored by. Um, Schaefer was really good at communicating clearly his ideas, and Nancy, I, I believe, even better. She's just she's so sharp and crystal clear. And I think as an intellectual, you know, you can sit up there in the ivory tower all day, but if you can't bring it down to the common person, you may not know your stuff as well as you think you do because communicating clearly is is important. I mean, we got another generation to raise up, right? And these philosophers and intellectuals hopefully have children. You know, they got to communicate to them their ideas, right? So in the same way, I think we as Christians, we have a calling uh, a, a, of the life of the mind to know God's word, to know the issues that are happening in our culture today, and show that what we believe is not some ethereal, just subjective faith, but that we believe something that's grounded in reality because mm. God has, is the author of creation. He's the author of the scriptures, and uh, we can trust him. And so my passion is, as a pastor, as a student and college pastor, is to communicate that clearly um, to students, that they all have a purpose. And that purpose, wherever it might be, as an engineer or as a police officer or investigator or a teacher or a, whatever they might be, an athlete, that God has called them to use their abilities and their skills and their mind for all for his glory and to not be slack in any of those things. And hopefully as a pastor, I can equip them to do so. And so mm. with, with Nancy, I think she's doing good work. And I think a lot of people could emulate what she's doing. Wow. Well, guys, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> all the people said amen. Okay. <laughs> so. Man, that's awesome, dude. So, so man, let's talk a little bit about Love Thy Body. What does she talk about in the book as well as what does she talk about? Um, she talked about tonight mm -hmm. and um, why is it important? What are some questions that we struggle with today? And we're seeing the news and even our generation, um, Generation Z is struggling with um, people in society in general. What are some things she talked about? She talks about in the book and why is it important today for us? Yeah, so um, the basic premise of her book comes from also her other books as well, but the fact value split. Yeah. And so the facts or the fact realm is, is it's like a two story worldview, as Francis Schaeffer would put it. So the lower story of a building, let's say, is a, is an image you can put in your mind if you're listening. So the facts level is where the public opinion is, where objective facts are, it's valid for everyone. But the values is the second story of the building, and that's your private, subjective, relativistic beliefs. It's it's subject to you, but it doesn't it doesn't have any bearing on anywhere any, on anyone else. And so people would put things like theology and morality up in the subjective sphere, but in the lower public sphere, they put science and empirical data, right, and those kind of things. And they say that's hard fact. Set in stone. Set kinda. in stone, right? But then all the things in the upper story, hey, you guys believe what you want, right? And so there's this split. This division. Mm -hmm. There's this division, and it's a it's a huge problem and this goes back to romanticism and the enlightenment and there's a lot that could be said there but 
in her book, Love Thy Body, she makes the distinction about personhood theory and how the fact-value split plays into personhood theory. Personhood theory uh, is um, the separation between person and body. So a body is your physical body. It's your expendable biological organism. But a person, it's, it's someone who has moral and legal standing. So that's in the upper story. So a person is very subjective. So um, what does someone do in the you know, transgender worldview uh, is they, they say, well, my body, biological organism, says one thing, but I deny my body. And I say, my person, I feel like I am. Or I self, I self, my person, I identify as this gender or that gender, the opposite of the biological sex. And so what they do is they say gender is fluid. They say mm-hmm. those kind of terms. What, what do they mean? Well, they mean that it's, it's subjective to the person, that they can determine what they are, but it's just a denial of God's design for them. And they may have those feelings, but feelings don't make reality. If I have a feeling of hatred towards someone and that feeling of hatred leads toward murder, that doesn't make it right right? I mean, that's sin. That's wrong. So I have to learn to deny my desires. And I was actually listening to an audio book on my way up today, uh, Charles Taylor, Secular Age. It's a big, big book, um, really hard. But one of the things he says, he says really succinctly, he said paganism, which is akin to secularism today, ancient paganism was all about self-assertion, but Christianity is about self-denial. And you see that um, that's very true. In our culture today. Let me say that again one time. So paganism is about self-assertion. Mm. Christianity is about self-denial. So we could say secularism is about self-assertion. Mm-hmm. And Christianity is about self-denial. And so you just see that everywhere. Uh, it's all about finding your authentic self, right? You, you can watch The Voice or American Idol or all these fun shows. Be who you are. You know, or yeah, dis- they discover the, who you what are. Was the, what was the thing I, I posted on Facebook? It was like the, the biggest thing that the devil will whisper to you is believe in yourself. Yes, yeah, you see the that? mantra of Disney. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah absolutely. And so um, that's the big danger is that if if we don't have something to ground our identity in not just our body, but our person, right, our, our whole being, mm-hmm. right, and and those to be connected, not to be split, you know, then, it, then there's going to be a lot of mess like there is today, right? And so I believe God is... It's the best who does that. The God of the scriptures, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He is the image of the invisible God. And he has shown us who he is through, you know, Jesus. Uh, But he has also shown us how we've been made and designed because he's a perfect designer. He didn't didn't mess things up. We messed it up with sin and we continue to mess it up uh, and continue to go further from him with these these pagan ideas. And and the church seems to adopt some of them at times and to to believe in them. yeah, learn a little bit about this humanism and mm-hmm. yeah. Could you give some examples for help? I think that'd be helpful to kind of understand. Oh, for it within the yeah. church and things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you see some churches, some people who are gay affirming, right? So they'll affirm same sex marriage and those kind of things, and it becomes a really a contentious issue. But it it really messes up with what God has said about marriage. It con- it's contrary to God's word. And why? Well, you look at Romans one, and he says God gave them up to their unnatural desires unnatural. What's that mean? Well, it doesn't go with nature, right? So it's going against biology. I mean, the male and female body are made perfectly for each other, right? I mean, that's that's science. That's biology. But that's God has created it that way. And so when we go against that, that is doing what is unnatural. It sounds like people making these arguments are wanting to live in the second floor mm-hmm. and hold everybody else to a standard on the first floor. Yeah, even though or, they, or they, even say, or even say, hey, you have your second floor. I got my second floor. Right? I, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, in, we're in we're in different buildings, man. Yeah. So it's all about uh, a, a radical view of autonomy as well. Like, yeah. I am my ultimate authority. There's no authority over me. Right? I am. I am in charge. Like, no one's going to tell me who I can Which be. Which is weird because be. isn't doesn't she really dive in deep into science? A mm-hmm. lot of her arguments because you show me some yeah. of her stuff is like she's like showing, hey, science actually is supporting my argument. Yeah. But so when they started losing the science battle, that's the thing. So like abortion, the abortion yeah. argument, right? Before the sonogram, right? We didn't know a lot about, like we do now, before the sonogram with a baby in the womb. I mean, baby has a heartbeat so early. Fingerprints in nine days. Didn't they say at conception there's a spark? Didn't you, didn't, yeah, you yeah, yeah, that? yeah, that's so in the book. At, yeah. Even at conception when the, uh, when, when the sperm hits the egg or whatever, yeah. um, there's a spark that actually happens. It's like a firework mm-hmm. show. Yeah. They are able to see this yeah. happen and take place. Mm-hmm. 
it's it's, like, it's it's phenomenal. So it's like life begins at conception, and science proves it. And science all the way through will prove it. But they have to once they started losing the science argument, they had to go to the personhood argument. So if you mm. go look at ethical books today about you know how do you even fight this, it all begins at sentience or you know awareness or personhood. And so um, even Peter Singer, they were talking about, was saying, it, oh, a three-year-old doesn't really even have sentience yet, so you can practice in- infanticide, those kind of things, because they, they're not really self-aware. But I have a three-year-old, and he's pretty self-aware. <laughs> so he knows who he is. <sighs> so scary. Yeah, but that, I mean, this that's the world we live in. This argument, I mean. That's we, why this is important. I mean, that's why, I mean, he even opens up the first chapter that it's called, uh, I hate me. It's a hatred of the body. You know, hmm. it's, the secular ethic demeans and hates the body. It doesn't love the body. It doesn't love the person. It demeans them. It destroys them. So that's that. that, that, that see, that's another interesting thing because even the title is "Love Thy Body." Um, we, I think, we talked about this. I think we talked about this in one episode. Is there's this idea of love today? It isn't really love. Love today in our world is. Um, uh oh, whose phone went off? That's mine, I think. Oh, the boss man. Yeah, I can't um, believe you. Yeah, that's okay. Right, but we're back. But love today, love is basically saying you can do whatever you want, and I can't tell you that you're wrong. Hmm. Um, but and this idea that God, you know, God is love, and He is. I don't want to say He's not. Um, but that's all He is. Hmm. Um, but there's there's yeah, there's we did these, talk about that. There is that yeah, the cross the cross. There's these hard but there's these other aspects of God. Thus there's these other aspects of reality um that add a little more beef to what love is. Um so it's interesting how she talks about, you know, their idea of loving their bodies, really hating it. Yeah. Um hmm. so yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because it means going against design. Yeah. Right. It's going against a, a thing she mentioned a telos or purpose. Right, everything has a telos or a design to it. So how do we, how do we navigate? Because you know, um, it's it's so encouraging to see some of these guys here, some college and high school guys are sitting here. They wanna, they wanna go to the state over just to hear about apologetics and how to defend and affirm their faith. Yeah. Now the biggest thing I've noticed is that I've been in churches and the things that you would think like um, homosexuality or, or transgender like that, you would think like yeah, like that we don't we don't encourage or celebrate that, but that's like. I'm not. I'm having these casual conversations on Sunday mornings, and, and our generation is just accepting and improving this. Yeah. And like we said, is that there's this love part of like the cross is all love now and no wrath. Hmm. We don't realize how holy God is. I mean, it's it's love and wrath, right? I mean, the both at the cross, truth yeah. and grace. Yeah. Jesus was truth and grace. So how does our generation and 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 how can how do we navigate through this, man? This is. This is hard. This yeah. is this is a very complicated situation because we're arguing with people that aren't using reason. Yeah. When, when they yeah. Sur- when they surrender, their foolish hearts are darkened. That's the thing. Their foolish hearts are darkened. They're darkened in their understanding, as Ephesians says. You know, and um, the it says when they refuse to honor God or give thanks to Him, in Romans one, they become futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts are darkened. It says it there as well, and so I think. You know, we got to realize that this foolishness is a moral foolishness, not necessarily intellectual. They will have very intellectual arguments, but that doesn't make it right, doesn't make it true. And so for us, what's so important uh, to do is to have compassion. I think we have to understand where they're coming from. We can't just sit in our fortresses and our churches and not engage these lost people. Mm. We need to invite them into our homes. We need to minister to them when they're hurting. Yeah. You know, we need to, we need to love on them. And now... That might be hard sometimes to maybe find those people that would be willing to want to come in your home maybe because they think you're so opposed to them because you're attacking their identity. But if you just show, show Christ's love to them, it, it could become a really good opportunity to show uh, them uh, that, that you love them, you accept them, but you don't approve of what they do. And I think have, you're saying, what does this generation do? What are we going to do? Well, I think telling the truth and learning to tell the truth mm-hmm. and not just saying I have these facts and it's me versus you, right? But look— it's the truth, and I love you, and I, well, as I'm telling mm. it to you, you know, it's letting your speech be seasoned with salt, letting it be gracious. And I think in a in an age of outrage, and in the information age where we think we know it all, um, Paul says you can be puffed up with knowledge, but if you don't you don't have love, you know, you're useless. Mm. And so we gotta have love, you know, and, and love shows itself in action. And love is not wishy washy, right? Mm. Real love hates. 
Real love hates what God hates. Now, these people make their identity the thing that they want to be, which is separate, right? I mean, my identity is not fixed up in, like, other people or my sexuality. My identity is in God, how he's made me, Yeah, right? That's so that's so good. I, you know, I think um, it's 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 a time where I think I'm scared. I was thinking about um, there's the Louis Giglio. When I grew up, he's got a passion. Mm-hmm. I remember that the White House he was going to speak. And this is when Obama administration was in, and mm-hmm. they didn't let him speak because of a message he gave against homosexuality, like yeah. a, like two decades yeah. prior to this event. And he had barely mentioned it in the message, but barely yeah. mentioned it. And so f- when I see that, I'm thinking about these incidents where men are losing their their careers. They're vanished. They're gone because yeah. of something they said or they Kelvin posted. Kelvin Cochran of the Atlanta yeah. Atlanta Fire Tree, who just wrote a book for a Bible study, had wasn't selling it at work or nothing, and he got let go of his job. And so, it's scary because I think in in one way the Christians like, well, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing good and and and, and all these things, um, you know, to be. The, but the problem is, is that we're gonna have to be more, I think, bold. And we're going to have to do it in Christ's name because we don't want to make the earth a better place for people to leave to go to heaven from hmm. or go to hev- hell from. Yeah, you yeah, know. I get um, what you're and so it's a scary time where, like, I think I think Christians have become passive. Yeah, or um, they pa- become either passive or they they literally are in fear. But part of that is because pastors have not been doing a good job equipping their people with God's word, and they have not been doing a good job in equipping them to engage these things. And we have sat back, fat and happy. You know, content with topical preaching, content with um, not taking serious our role in the body and our role in mm. the home, right? Home. So one thing that Gould likes to say here, Paul Gould at Southwestern, he says, um, you know, liberals won't have kids. They'll just take conservatives when they go to college. Mm. You know? And they do that. C- conservative kids and Christian kids, we always talk about kids falling away from their faith when they go to college. Well, why does that happen? We don't equip them. We send them as like sheep in the midst of wolves and say, good luck. Does that sound familiar, Dakota? Sounds like two episodes ago. <laughs> yeah. We've, uh, we've, but that, but that, see, that's, it's, it's good timing having him on as a college and a youth pastor, because we've talked about one, we talked about the, uh, expositional preaching conference that they just had here. Okay. The text and, and the, the, the importance of getting back to scripture, um, and walking through that. But the reason, one of the reasons we talked about why that's important is because this is a very opportune time to do that because our generation and their generation, um, here sitting with us is um, the studies have shown that our generation is not affiliated religiously a lot. It's on the, the rise. It's, it's the on the rise. The, yeah. The nuns. yeah. Um, but our generation and the next generation, the next generation is con- generation Z. They said is considered the first post Christian generation in American history. Um, they don't have necessarily a negative view of Christianity, but more than that, they don't really have a view of Christianity. Which is great, and which opinion. is exactly they they're they're not they're not it's an anti Christianity, but but they're also very interested in spirituality. So they're open to that type of conversation, yep. and they're curious, you know, what Christianity believes, and particularly what the Bible says, because they haven't heard any of it. Yeah. So this yeah. is a wonderful opportunity uh, yeah. in our in our culture. It's almost like pre Christian uh, Rome in a sense, where Christianity was new. Sure, they've heard about it. Uh, they've they've heard about a Jesus, right? Or they've seen it made fun of on TV or something or cartoons. But it's an opportunity for us as Christians to just to show them by our life and by our words, and that this is something that speaks to all of our lives, all of reality. Mm. You know. Well, because we had an episode this morning. It's funny we talked about this. I think we're so passionate about it, and um, because we listen to this podcast about Generation Z, and there's a lot to take from it. But like the text driven preaching as far as what that entails because i think for me as a young guy i've been to all different types of churches and i'm so fed up with the seeker sensitive movement that is hmm. that is catering to unbelievers in a sense and what it is is and I, I, there's numbers that show it i mean there's numbers that are showing that like at, i think i keep throwing up this number 88 percent of these seeker sensitive these non-affiliated people don't attend a sunday morning service so, and I've I've said this many times is that it's like it's like planning a party for people who have no no intentions of showing up, hmm. and so let's get back. Like, we've always said this that we have our little one liners that we love to just express it, but let's teach the Bible by teaching the Bible. Yeah, you know, <laughs> let's do that. We can be. Yeah. Let's let's. Why can't we go to that man? Because I think at the end of the day, like. It's because people, they want their appetites wet, and they just think the Bible's boring, and they think the Bible's boring because they have a low view of God and a high view of themselves, mm. and that's the danger. 
because they want self-realization. They're, they're, they're taking in this exclusive humanism, this secular humanism, and they want to be just like the world. But you cannot be just like the world if you are trying to be like Christ. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy because, well, in the quote, Tony Morita said this at the preaching conference. He said, this is where we got our title for that episode from. He said, hey, God wrote a book. Why would you want to preach anything else? Hmm. And it's, if, you, if you just think about but, that. But it's this, um, so, so people are asking questions. They're wanting answers, mm-hmm. and God Himself has written to us. And you're mm-hmm. asking all these questions about God. Why wouldn't you look there? Yeah, mm-hmm. amen. Because what what are the things that like text it brings up these topics? Mm-hmm. Apologetics, you know, um, we're rec- racial conciliation, for example, yeah. in this world. It it shouldn't be like a little section that we like. It's like a check off list. That should be an outpour of our lives. Mm-hmm. Is to love people no matter you know. N- it, Every nation, every tongue, we should love all people, no matter where they come from or their background, stuff like that. Yeah. But this, like, we have to make it a topic. We have the topical sermon about. Well, people want to keep bringing stuff like that up, and and sure, it's a problem in the secular world, and in some churches, it's a problem. But they might be not even be really saved people that call themselves churches, right? Like Westboro Baptist Church is probably not a real Christian church, right? Because they are filled with so much hate and no love whatsoever, <laughs> right? Um, so, I went to a Lutheran high school. I got so much flack for being Baptist because that's exactly the time they came out too. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, when it comes to these issues, I think if we are filled with the Spirit, the natural outflow will be um, many different things in a community and in a church, and uh, obviously the exalting of God's Word and um, the right perspective on mm-hmm. ministry and how the church should function. It shouldn't be a preference-driven thing, right? It shouldn't be, I come from my traditional music or my contemporary music, and man, you better got stuff for my kids, you know? Like, it's like, no, I'm not I'm not McDonald's. This isn't McChurch, right? Or, you know, it <laughs> well, can't BK have it your way, church. right? So have to McChurch. use that. Well, well someone um, else used it, I think, like so Tom I, I think you're talking about White, um, Cedarville's president. He wrote a book called McChurch. Oh, he's talking about franchising churches where... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great book about that. We're actually talking about that the other day about just the, well, this blessing. idea. Yeah. But um, yeah, like like in Romans twelve, I've been saying this. This has just been on my heart. But it, it, Paul says outdoing each other in honor. Mm. I love that. Like yeah. outdoing each other in honor, and yeah. that's just a beautiful way to think about it. Is how man, we're just we should like you said, like it should be an overflow of our hearts. Think outside ourselves, mm-hmm. you know. And so I'm, I'm burdened, man. I think for this generation where we have so much ahead of us. And it's a real deal. This is mm. this is something we take serious. We need to take God's word serious. It's authoritative. It's like he said, God wrote a book. Yeah. Think about that. God yeah. wrote a book. Mm. It's living and active, man. Hebrews four twelve. God revealed Himself. Yeah. Through Christ. Mm. Man, it's just a, we don't. I think we just say it, and it just becomes this. We we become numb to the power of that. It's like God wrote a book, and we have it at our disposal. But we have them. In, we have in our bookshelf with, with dust on it. And if you want problems, you look at this world. You look at the news. That book will help. That book mm. will show you. Because it's more than just a book. It's, it's more than just a book. And that's one thing about the generation mm. is that we yeah. have to show why this information that the Bible is different from anything else. Mm. And so um, I'm passionate about it because I, I, I'm so burdened for the for the the brokenness of this world. You know, I, I think it talks about in Matthew nine where where, God, where Jesus is looking. Mm. And yes, he's, he's, he's seeing the social and religious disorder mm. and people that were neglected by religious leaders. Yeah. And um, for us to to wrestle with this stuff, and, you know, so we kind of went somewhere, didn't we? Yeah, this was fun. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this, was, this was the most fun I've had so far. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I think I'm sweating because I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> got that excitement got, sweat. Got that nasty back sweat because I think it's um, oh that's that's lovely TMI <laughs> TMI TMI. Well, I think it's it's just funny. Yeah, it's pretty gross. But man, so so Nancy Piercy was um, was awesome. And yeah. So uh, I think we kind of used her book as a way to kind of talk about different. We can kind of go different places. So, yeah. um, so man, we got seven guys here, high school and college. So what are some things tonight that y'all have, that y'all have heard probably for the first time or anything that y'all can kind of think of? Anyone want to share? Don't be shy. Come, we got a group of guys. Oh, we got a guy that has, I'll a, tell you what, has we'll, a notebook. We'll, tell you what, we'll start out here. One thing you've learned or why you were interested in coming with Travis here this weekend. Grab the mic. Go, Go ahead, ahead Jared. Um, Jared Keys. Jared. Hey, you, got, you, got look, you, got, you got like almost kissed the mic. But All right, don't. is this good? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right, I'm, from, I'm Jared from Baton Rouge. Uh, How old are you? One thing I learned, uh, I'm 18. 18. Uh, one thing I learned was beauty is objective mainly, 
but it can also be relative to a person. I don't completely understand it yet, and I hope to dive into it more. But um, that's that's really been interesting me lately. I, like um, and uh, Nancy is that her name? Yep. Nancy, she she gave a great speech, man. Uh, I can't pull up my notes quick enough to pull up a good point. No, it's fine, man. Yeah, everything she said was so on point, and she had facts to back up everything, and every new sentence was like something something else to teach. Like, I learned something every other sentence, basically. But mm. Yeah. Well, I don't, most stuff, I don't even understand what she's saying, but <laughs> a lot smarter than me. Um, anybody else, guys? You, you the, get out the notebook. Tell us your name, uh, where you're from, and your age. Okay. Um, I'm Noah Lyle. Um, I'm from Baton Rouge, and I'm 17. And one thing that really fascinated me was the fact that the fracture truth that was meant to be together in the like the house sort of truth thing, the top bottom, what 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 God designed to be together, they've changed to be unnatural to fit their own form and their own will. So. I don't know. That I just kind of, I never thought about I, uh, the way that way. I've only thought about it on two, like this is right and this is wrong, not the fact that sometimes they take it and change it, but not to where just parts of it, they just take parts of what yeah. God designed. So. All right, man. Well, it's it's um it's cool to have some guys here, at college and high school, that are that have joined you to come talk. Um, you know, I think it's neat, man, that you're like. You're doing it. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you know, I, it's encouraging because I don't know how many. And youth, you're bringing people with you. That's great. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I love you, that. Yeah. Because how many youth pastors. Discipleship, man. Discipleship. How many youth, yeah, discipleship. But how many, youth, I don't know many youth pastors that really, you know, I could put a lo- enough effort into apologetics. Mm-hmm. Um, luckily, I had, I had a, the, the, whole, the home church I went to that we did like it. We actually had someone that come in and talk about, you know, um, defend, you know, apologists that came in and spoke on Wednesday night, yeah. which was awesome. But well, I think apologetics is, um, it's huge. And this is why it's literally giving a reason for the hope that you have. It's explaining why. Yeah. That's the apologetics. And so we just can't fill their head with knowledge and just memory verses only. You have to tell them why so that they'll put it into practice so that'll motivate their action. And so this is discipleship for me. This is like, I mean, I'm preaching through Colossians uh, mm-hmm. with these students on Wednesday night and then also the college students doing Bible study and really didn't, didn't you just remember, diving deep. Didn't you remember Colossians? Was that one of the passages you remembered? What You, you mean memorized? Yeah. Um, I'm doing it now. So I'm doing it now with a couple of these guys are actually memorizing it with me too. So we're trying to memorize the whole book. You're going to have to quote it to some spiritual music and then send it to us. <laughs> yeah. Some ethereal angel choir. That's the right. I have like, yeah. have like a really epic sermon yeah. jam where I you're mean, just quoting to give and wrap it To any listeners who, I mean, they um, would be interested in how we do it, it's uh, An- Andrew Davis's book, An Approach to the Extended Memorization of Scripture. It's endorsed by John Piper. Real short, you can get it for free online, PDF or Kindle for a dollar. Um, but we just do a verse a day, and it's been really encouraging. Uh and uh, it's been really helpful for my study because as I meditate on the Word, because I'm memorizing it, it really affects my preaching even. You know, So it's been really, really helpful. Mm. And uh, it's kind of funny when I, I look at these guys, like even tonight, there was a, a picture of the uh, ancient Greek worldview, and then two of the guys looked at me and like, hey, isn't that like kind of out of Colossians? <laughs> like, because some of this stuff, and I'm just like, yeah, these guys get it. You know, so it was, it was really encouraging uh, to be like man my labor's not in vain like you know they're 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 listening and it's it's really neat uh so i mean doing apologetics and teaching people the scriptures and using those things to uh and spiritual disciplines to bring these guys up in the lord so that they when they have families and they mentor someone specifically that they pass that along as well like my my method of discipleship is well, if i'm pouring into you i'm expecting you to go pour into someone else mm. You know, if I'm meeting with you one-on-one and you want to do that, well, I'm not doing this unless you're going to pour into someone else as well. And so, obviously, I can't meet with everybody, right? So I need to pour into some of the stronger ones who are eager, who approach me first, you know, or those kind of things, and be like, all right, let's do this. And you're going to go pour into someone after we're done here in a few weeks. Wow. You know, and so that's important because you you can't be a superhero. And I think too many pastors fall because they try to be a superhero. Mm. You know, they get under the pressure and they start to give in to temptation and sin, and it crushes them. And we, 
I don't have it all together. I got you can ask these guys. They they see my flaws. They seen some of my mess. I mean, maybe not all of it yet, but some of it, you know. And um, it it takes, you know, I think it takes a lot of encouragement, insight from others. I've I've really leaned on like my pastor, Lewis Richardson, and Laramie, who uh, you guys have had on the podcast, and also some of my former pastors, and calling them just for advice and for help because yeah i was well equipped here but there's so much that you don't learn in seminary that you just got to learn when you're out there and on the field yeah but you man you got to soak up everything in seminary do not snooze on one class i Hmm. would say don't skip class to go to (laughs) (laughs) or chapel any of you who do that or chapel (laughs) well that's encouraging man because i you know um that's something i said about you being genuine in your faith um because a lot of guys i look up to um when i talk to them or some just individuals here, they're always, how can I pray for you, but never how can you pray for me? Is guys are not authentic enough or transparent about the struggles that they're having. Hmm. And I think that's a danger that we all want to hide yeah. um, what our struggles are, or what our burdens are, or what's going hmm. on in our lives. Yeah. And we find that even at seminary that we I thought was a utopia, and we find that's not true, that there's guys who are struggling with serious sins. Hmm. And um, I think it's in, important as followers of Christ, to, as brothers of Christ, yeah. And sisters of Christ to to open up yeah um, about what's on our heart you know um, yeah well I'll say even kind of funny you know you've encouraged me by even just saying hey you were genuine with me and that's kind of how our relationship started just genuineness and stuff but I even had a moment the other day where you know I'm sitting here asking prayer requests to students and I'm not sharing my burdens with the students and it was mm. just early Sunday morning but one of the leaders who knew what was going on in my life said hey Travis how's how's your, how's Thaddeus doing you know he got hurt and stuff and I didn't want to share that. And not that I was like, I'm not going to share that, but I wasn't thinking about, hey, they could be praying for me, you know, and mm-hmm. being authentic with the students and that, that being an opportunity to open up. Uh, you know, I was meeting with the student uh, last week in my office and, you know, got to just share some burdens, you know, and just what was going on. And they, they had asked me that. And so that meant a lot to be able to do that and be authentic and let them see, hey, I don't have it all together. But sometimes even as a pastor, because I'm thinking so much about the person in front of me, I'm not thinking about also hey, how can I show them that I'm a real person too, that I don't have it all together? But not that I'm trying to dump garbage on people, right? But just say, hey, I'm I'm figuring this stuff out too, just like I'm you not, are. I'm not perfect. Yeah, I'm not perfect. God, I, I, I love how one of my friends said it. He says, uh, uh, you know, we're all under construction. You know, God's building each one of us up. And I mean, we just, I just got done preaching on that this past week, Colossians 2, 1 through 7. Hmm. You know, it talks about, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And then the rest of that text is built off of walk in him. The rest of the verbs are passive. It's something that God does. He says, uh, being rooted and built up in him, established in him. I might have misquoted it, and I'm trying to memorize Colossians. Uh, but, you know, after that, after being established in him, it says, um, abounding with thanksgiving. Abounding with thanksgiving is what you do. Rooted, built up, established, that's what God does. And if you choose to walk in him, you choose to walk in obedience, God will root you. And he will build you and he will establish you. Mm. And your proper response to that, abounding, overflowing with thanksgiving. And if we're overflowing with thanksgiving, we're going to be walking in them. If we're going to be walking in them, we're going <laughs> to overflow with thanksgiving. And God's going to do all that stuff in the middle, you know. Wow. And I think that's a, a really helpful way to look at the Christian life for sure. That's awesome. It's encouraging because I think, um, you know, we, we, I was talking to someone, I can't remember the, the context of the conversation, but how we try to find Christ in people. Um, we look at that in pastors is where this that the, the pastor position has been elevated. It's like, hey, you're called to be in ministry to be a pastor. Like, oh, great! I get to I get all this notoriety and people love me and people write you know I'm gonna write books and all this stuff. And what's weird is, and they they fall and then we say, why? Well, how did that happen? I was like, hmm. you don't realize that 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 he's a sinner. Yeah. That can't that, put your hope in man. Yeah, you're putting Christ in this guy. And we do that all the time. I think we felt it that we do it. We now have athletes and sometimes. We don't want to see people's imperfections, and so even in a world, in a world where we can edit them, we exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, c- it's and uh, which is sick is is that we we compare our behind the scenes to people's highlights. Hmm. You know, we do that all the time. Yep. Even as guys, um, it, 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 talking about the generation, we're so performance driven. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this desire that this individualistic mindset of you know I gotta I gotta grind I gotta keep you know doing 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 and yeah. get my name out there and everything like that. Um, it's just the you know life, the faith and and life with God is just it's a mystery, mm-hmm. and uh, we spend our entire lives trying to comprehend everything. Yep, um, absolutely. But that's what's fun. We 
Uh, I love a pastor. I think um, Alistair Begg said this in the podium. He said, I love it. I've heard it many times, but he said it. He said, the Bible is inexhaustible. Hmm. We got a book that we can just continue to spend the rest of our lives talking about. That's right. We can never stop. That's right. That's what's so it's gotta, fun. It's got to be the center of our lives. Um, it's yeah, because be. we, you know, me and Clayton talked about even even the calling to go to ministry and everything is that being here, there's just this, this our soul is content in a way that's like any, unlike anything else. Um, I've played college football and I've done all that, but being here and learning about God is something that I can't, um, there's nothing that I can compare it to, hmm. um, which is awesome. That's awesome, man. Amen. Amen to that. Good talk. Well, Real guys, talk. we got to get out of here. These guys are tired. Yeah, these guys are tired. Well, man, Travis, I'm so happy that you were here. Is there anything that I can do to kind of um, direct people to? Um, yeah, you got like a blog you have or a something, blog. don't you? I do you, have a blog. You got some stuff. So give yourself a plug. I mean, I'm not blogging like crazy, not at least till I graduate. Yeah. But um, my blog is travismcneely.wordpress.com. Wordpress. And then my Twitter and my Instagram is all at Travis, Travis McNeely. McNeely. Yeah. So you go to Woodlawn Baptist Church, and mm-hmm. your position is you're the... College and student minister, or awesome. student and college minister. Oh. Well, eventually we're going to, I think, interview the whole staff. Man, you know, yeah, I just got to get my senior pastor. Yeah, then, Laramie. Yeah, this is going to be the one-stop shop for uh, information Baptist. from Woodlawn Baptist Church. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, the broadcast around Baton Rouge or something? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, man, I'm so happy that you came on here. It's, it's been a blessing f- uh, for me to have you here and just talk to you. Uh, I don't want to sound like a big bromance, but I feel like this is a commercial to discipleship. <laughs> <laughs> Five steps to discipleship with Dakota and Travis and Clayton. I'm just kind of here. This is y'all's thing. Sorry. This is y'all's bromance. <laughs> my bromance um, is with, uh, my bromance bromance is with uh, Tim McGrew tomorrow Tim McGrew. once he gets here. Well, hey, guys, listen up. Um, listeners, if you're listening, uh, we're just so thankful that you're here and that you've, you've stayed with us. Um review subscribe share this podcast with those around you and um, just tell us about this interview that we've had i hope we've, you, this has been a source of encouragement for you and your walk um, as we dive into the lives of others so we thank you for joining the conversation and we are out deuces Peace. dakota dare here you have just listened to the falling forward podcast connect with us at fallingforwardpodcast.com to join the conversation access show notes or reach out to today's guest Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. It is very much appreciated. The song used in this podcast is called Stunts by Arthur Nelson. Find his music on iTunes or Spotify. And thank you for listening and remember to keep falling forward.